You know what's really sad about this year's AEW All Out? It's not the fact that it seems like this show was just thrown together in a couple of weeks and it was all over the map. Or that you had 15 matches, including 11 on the main card. Like, we don't need that many. It's ridiculous. Um, it's not that different people were injured and weren't able to perform, such as Thunder Rosa. It's the fact that, you know, probably 18 hours or so, because I'm recording this on Monday evening, 18 hours or so after the show, nobody's talking about the actual show. Nobody's talking about the actual matches, the moments, some of the big notable things that happened during the event. It's all about backstage drama. A bunch of fucking mean girls, high school BS. I'm not going to talk about that here. I'll do that in a separate video on Tuesday, I think. Um, instead, I'm going to actually stick to reviewing AEW All Out, which to me was a mixed bag. There was some bad, dumb, stupid. There was some, okay, this is cool. There was some really, really good on this show. Uh, so it had it all. <laughs> it ran kind of the whole gamut as far as I was concerned. I thought the Casino Battle Royal was kind of a dud. And maybe that's largely just owed to the finish. And sure, everybody knew like who it was behind the mask and where this was going in some way or fashion. But it doesn't mean that the ending to the match wasn't incredibly anticlimactic and incredibly lame. The way it came across sucked. So because of what happened later in the night doesn't change how that match went. It sucked. I'm watching that trios tournament final match. And, you know, it's also weird to me that you have a trios tournament final where you're crowning your first trios champions. And then you have two other trios tag matches on the show. Feels like you should have only had one of those on this show. I understand in part TK is probably trying to get as many people on the card as he possibly can. Similar to what WWE's done for years. But sometimes you just don't need to. Sometimes less is more. And I look at this match and I say... I'd have much rather honestly seen just a one-on-one -on -one match between Hangman Page and Kenny Omega. I, mean, I really didn't need the trios part. I really didn't. Just give me Page versus Omega. I feel like that's where the better story was. That's where the more interesting story would have been. And those two probably could have torn the house down. I know a lot of you really like this match. You know, I guess this is not the type of match that involves the Bucks of Suck that is my style. It's not for me, and I understand that. Jade Hulk made quick work of Athena, and I say quick work, like, what is this match, four minutes? You know, get in, get out, and it's interesting that um, they had 11 matches on the main card, but you had a few of them that went pretty short, and this was one of them, and that was probably fine with me. You had a bunch of people, I think, believing that Athena might be the one to beat Jade Cargill, who certainly was not here. <laughs> um, and then the fourth match on the card, I spent the whole time thinking, like, this is really the best payoff that you have here at All Out for Wardlow and FTR? Like, anybody else just feel like this is an incredible waste? Like, it feels like a lot of the AEW fans are really into FDR right now. FDR, FTR has, you know, buzz. And you're not doing anything to validate that. And Wardlow, just a couple of months ago, had a ton of buzz and a ton of energy behind him. A ton of momentum. And we're just kind of burning it here. That's really odd. Just to play second fiddle to Samoa Joe just showing up because he just wants to get paid. Yikes. He still gives me that vibe. And as far as I'm concerned, this whole damn match should have just been a push Finley spot. Let her come out, do the broken pencil, beat up Sanjay Dutt, pin him one, two, three. Frickin' that should have been the match. All the other shit that they did was just a waste of time in my opinion. Finley was the star here. Push her. I mean, would it have been so bad if that was the whole match? Probably not. I was really disappointed that Powerhouse Hobbs and Ricky Starks were so short. I don't know if this was due to legit injury or just like needed to cut time or they thought five minutes was enough. Uh, but this was one of these matches that actually had story and purpose behind it. This was one of these matches that could have went 10 or 15 minutes and it didn't here. And that was unfortunate. This felt like a match that you want to have go a little bit more because you want to pay it off at the pay-per-view. But it didn't, so it was a shame. It was also a shame with the tag team title match because, my God, the acclaimed have indeed arrived. 
the whole scissor daddy shit and all that other stuff, like, fantastic. But they have indeed arrived. And everything is pointing to, no offense to Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland, but god damn. Like, you listen to that crowd and you can feel so many things have fallen into place for the acclaimed in the right way. Like, it's taken them time, but they've gotten over in the right way. Now you've added another piece to the mix, whether intentional or not. It's kind of organically happened with uh, badass Billy Gunn. Like, you, you just look at all the factors at play, just how intensely, emotionally behind the acclaimed the Chicago crowd was. To me, they made the wrong decision here. Tony Khan made the wrong decision. The acclaimed should have won the tag team titles. You're going to say, well, he wanted to give Swerve and Keith Lee a run. Okay, we'll validate the acclaimed, have them win, and then quickly have them drop the straps. That's okay. Not every damn championship reign has to be long. But you got to be smart enough to recognize the momentum of the moment. And if you need to, you call an in-match audible and say, fuck whatever we planned before. Like, the best laid plan is only as good <laughs> as the way it's going to be received. The match was great. It was fantastic. And then there was the finish and the wrong team won and it felt like it let the air out of the building a little bit. And then the interim women's championship, I'm personally, personally, it's not, they're not UFC. I hate this concept of the interim champions. I do. Old man yelling at clouds, whatever. I, I'm just not a fan of it. Because Thunder Rose is out. Now you're going to crown an interim women's champion. But when you come back, you got the inevitable. I get the thought. I get the approach was let's book like a champion versus champion thing. But shit, as many people as they've got dropping, like that concept's going to run out pretty quickly. Like, if somebody's only going to be out a few weeks or a month or two, like, let them be. Let them keep the championship. Keep the champion fresh. Like, they don't always have to be featured. And by God, you know, like, it's not like you're featuring Thunder Rosa much anyway. So, um, but at least uh, Mid Baker didn't win. At least she didn't win. So we got something else. That's cool. Uh, but the last four matches are what we really want to focus on here the most because... This is where Tony Khan did some good business because the Young Lions roar, baby! Luchasaurus and Christian Cage are getting paid by the hour, bitches! Hey, fuck Jungle Boy up! That's what I'm talking about! Hell with him! Get in, get out, and get over it! And Christian got himself over. He taught Jungle Boy a thing or two about how big boy business is done. I'm sure Jungle Boy came to him in the weeks preceding this, and they're trying to strategize about how they put together the match, and Jungle Boy is saying, hey, it'd be really cool, and it'd be really cool if we did this, and Christian's like, yeah, that's not going to work for me, brother. <laughs> I was thinking, you get smashed, this will be good for you, and then you get rolled into the ring, and then I beat you really quickly, one, two, three, and it works for everybody. And Jungle Boy says, how does that work for me? And Christian said, oh, I'm sorry. You thought everybody included you. It just meant me, sir. <laughs> he squashed him. And like I said, you know, with the number of matches you had on the card, you have, I have a couple of short ones. I'm sure people were disappointed at this. I sure the hell wasn't. Uh, Chris Jericho versus Brian Danielson was okay. I just want, like, the whole time this match is going on, frankly, I'm looking at this and saying, You've got the two young lions roaring here. That's all fine and good. But if you remember, it was all out a year ago, wasn't it, that Brian Danielson made his AEW debut? And one year later, how has that really worked out? Like a, a Jericho versus Danielson feels like the type of mid-card feud you want to have at a big pay-per-view. Like, it could just be about a personal issue between the two. You don't need any titles. I get all of that. But good Lord. Like, you've had Daniel Brian Danielson for a year, and this is the best that you've done with him? And now a year after a debuting it all out, he's losing to 50-something Chris Jericho? Yeah. Interesting. But I guess the Lionheart roared! And then you got the last of the trios tag matches... And all I'm going to say is this. Malachi Black went tiptoeing through the tulips. And Sting helped them smell the roses. You're not going to pull any of your wannabe, whack-ass, 
great mood of tricks on Sting. He's been there. He's done it. He's seen it all. And frankly, Tony Khan was smart. Could have just made Sting the AEW world champion. He wouldn't have everybody talking about drama. They'd be talking about your in-ring product, your shows. You know, but everybody fears Sting. And we know it. And Malachi Black also fears Sting. Uh, but this was a good match. And, you know, like the way they have utilized Sting for the most part, I've enjoyed. Um, use him in spots. The spot that should be using him in, though, is as world champion. And you're going to say a lot of other things. I'm going to say, would it really be that much worse at this point? Would it really? Uh, but then we get to the main event. And I know I, I was trying to catch up before the show and trying to figure out what the hell happened. I'm like, so is Punk taking on Moxley and his champion versus champion to figure out who's the undisputed champion? And then that's where I got clued in. No, Moxley squashed him a couple weeks ago in like three minutes because of his injured foot. I'm like, what the fuck did you do that for? But anyways, and then you got people talking about, well, Punk might be uh, booed in Chicago. He's not going to get booed in Chicago. He wasn't going to. Uh, well, un until the match got underway. And then people saw that his offense was kind of mid to suck. And they said, mm, this is kind of crappy. Um... Why have Moxley squashed him a couple of weeks ago just to have him get the win here? Like, yeah, I don't think this main event was all that great personally. And, and that could be admittedly in part because I was just waiting to see what was going to go down with MJF and whether or not he was actually going to reappear, whether he was going to be the devil. And that was really well done. Like, once Punk won, you're like, okay, we know where this is going. And the way that they did the MJF shit was fantastic. Tony Khan's voice being played on the message. Like, this, this is the type of shit that was really, really well done. Uh, it came across Big League. It came across like MJF is the star of AEW. And frankly, it's because he is. Um, just a couple of things here. One, personally, they should have just had MJF win the title here. Right? Would that have been so bad? Well, a lot of you might say the after with the post media, uh, the post show media scrum. Uh, no, probably MJF should have won the title here. I, that's what I would have done. Uh, second, like the challenge now is is MJF can't do the heel thing anymore, and if he tried to do the heel thing with him, it's just going to be awkward and not going to work. Like I mean, MJF got a bigger pop in Chicago than CM Punk did. Think about that. Doesn't mean you have to change a ton fundamentally about MJF's character, but you have to adapt and adjust and be smart enough to realize what's going on and what you're hearing, seeing, seeing and feeling. And uh, it's going to be really hard for people to boo MJF at this point. They don't want to. And sometimes you have, can't fight against that grain and you just have to go with it. I personally wish MJF would have just won the freaking title. That would have really given you something to buzz about. And also playing at the seed of, hey, AEW, we only have a few pay-per-views a year. If you watch our TV show, you need to watch these pay-per-views because you never know what's going to happen. And you can say, well, you have MJF, and now you can save that for another time. All right, I get that. Like, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just saying in this moment, and especially with some of the stuff that happened afterwards, I probably would have just went ahead and went all the way. Because I would have been really curious to see if MJF beat CM Punk in Chicago, would he have actually gotten booed? Would he have? Inquiring minds would like to know. Uh, but anyways, the MJF return was fantastic. The tag team title match was great outside of the wrong team, in my opinion, winning. Um, you know, so this show had some really good things. Some of these matches were short and it had to be by design. Although, like I said, I wish Hobbs and Starks would have gotten more time. Maybe even Jade and Athena would have gotten a little more time. Absolutely no issue with Christian getting in and out that quickly. But you guys can tell me what you thought about AEW All Out and just the show. We will talk about the drama in another video. All right.